Werner Hartmann, the Stereo King. Werner Hartmann was living the American dream. He worked his way up from being a penniless German immigrant to a millionaire in the electronics industry. But the dream was shattered on a warm summer's night in 1982, when Hartmann died in his Chicago mansion after being shot 14 times. Friends and employees were appalled. Werner could sell anything to anyone. He loved his business and he loved talking to people. It would take the best part of a decade for investigators to uncover the shocking truth. Eva Hartman had just pulled up outside her parents' home in Northbrook, a suburb of Chicago, in the early hours of June 9th, 1982. To be precise, it was 4.30 a.m. She was worried about going inside because she thought her father would be angry about how late it was. After all, she was only 14. She'd been out with her stepmother, Deborah, who'd just given her a lift home. Deborah and Werner had been separated for a time and she was not currently residing at the property. Walking up to the front door, the pair found it open. And that was the first sign that something was amiss. Strains of loud classical music were echoing through the house, but Werner Hartmann, whom everyone knew as the Stereo King of Chicago, was nowhere to be seen. Deborah suggested Eva should go upstairs and check where her father was. Finding his bedroom door ajar, she pushed it open and discovered him naked, lying on the floor in a vast pool of blood. She screamed and begged Deborah to call an ambulance. But after surveying the scene, Deborah insisted that they leave the house immediately and drive to the nearest police station together. A short time later, at the Northbrook Police Department, Deborah informed them that her soon-to-be ex-husband had just taken his own life. Sergeant James Wilson was the first on the scene and arrived at the property just before 5 a.m. Werner Hartmann was dead. He was completely undressed and lying on his back on the bedroom carpet. The evidence suggested that he'd left the shower before being attacked and collapsing onto the floor. Around the body were discovered several shell casings. There were multiple gunshot wounds to the head and torso. On the face alone, Wilson counted five entry wounds, one in the forehead, one in the right eye and jaw, another in the left cheek, and finally, one in the corner of the mouth. The autopsy would later show that Werner Hartmann was hit by a total of 14 bullets. In other words, suicide could definitely be ruled out as a cause. According to ballistics, the murder weapon was a Mac-10, a small submachine gun made by the US manufacturer Military Armament Corporation. Aside from the casings, Officers couldn't find any other clues in either the house or the garden. There were no signs of a break-in, so it was assumed that Hartman had either let the perpetrator into the house himself or that the person responsible had had a key. Investigators thought the sheer number of bullets fired seemed to point towards it being a personal attack, and they soon began by focusing on Werner's closest relationships. In the hours that followed, the investigators questioned Eva and Deborah separately, and later Hartman's ex-wife, Vasily. So, to reiterate, Vasily was his first wife, Eva's mother. Deborah was his current wife and Eva's stepmother. It transpired that all three had been out at a restaurant together earlier in the evening. When Werner failed to join them as planned, Deborah encouraged the other two to stay out anyway and visit a series of local bars with her late into the night. They also traced Werner's final movements. On June the 8th, Hartman left his office shortly after 7pm. Before leaving, he told his ex-wife, Vasily, who still worked as an accountant at his business, that Deborah was coming to the house that evening. They were planning to discuss the final details of their separation agreement because, as you've gathered, Werner's second marriage was also on the verge of divorce. Vasily then locked the office up and drove to Pinocchio's Pizza Pub, where she'd arranged to meet her daughter, Eva, for dinner. 
Both were surprised when Deborah Hartman was already waiting for them at the door. Vasily asked her why she hadn't gone to Werner's house as planned. Her husband wanted to take a shower, Deborah replied. He'd be joining them shortly and there would be plenty of time to talk about those things later in the evening. After dinner, when Werner hadn't materialised, Deborah suggested they all go dancing together. Vasily was surprised. Quote, she didn't like me. Spending that evening together was very strange, she later told officers. Nevertheless, Deborah was persistent, and the three women visited several nightclubs before parting ways. Deborah accompanied her stepdaughter Eva home, where they then discovered Werner's lifeless body. During a break in the interviews, Deborah laid down on the floor for a nap. The officers had already got the impression that the violent death of her husband had left her comparatively cold. Now she'd gone to sleep, seemingly without a care, while the police started the investigation into her husband's murder. They found her behaviour unusual, to say the least. Their suspicions only grew when they discovered that Deborah had been in an extramarital relationship with a man named John Korobik for months. Korobik was a wannabe professional tennis player who still lived with his parents and occasionally worked as a salesman in a gun shop. But, like Deborah, it seemed her lover also had an alibi for the night of the crime. His employer, James Pappas, owner of the Gun World store, testified that Korobik had visited him at home around 8pm on June the 8th. They stayed there until around 11pm before they went to a restaurant in Wooddale. His wife, Elizabeth, confirmed the statement. In addition, the question naturally arose, what motive would the lovers have had for the murder? Werner Hartmann knew about the affair and had agreed to the divorce. Two suspects with an alibi, no murder weapon, no motive. The investigation seemed to have quickly reached a dead end. But at least with regard to the motive, new clues emerged as soon as the police subjected the murder victim's background to a more detailed examination. Josef Werner Hartmann, his birth name, was born in Germany on March 25, 1944, according to the US Social Security Index. His birthplace was listed as the Black Forest, which is actually a large region in the southwest of Germany. It's strange that the town wasn't specified, but it wasn't. On October 2nd, 1961, 27-year-old Werner emigrated to the USA on board the Hanseatic via Cookshaven, Southampton and New York City. He didn't have much money, but he had a lot of ambition. He took any job he could find. For example, he sold odds and ends at flea markets or went door to door selling newspaper subscriptions. In 1964, he met a young waitress named Vasily. The two dated, soon became engaged and married the following year. The marriage produced two daughters, Stephanie and Eva. Vanna soon realised that the little money he was earning wasn't going to stretch to supporting a family of four. Back in Germany, he'd worked as an electronics salesman, which he'd enjoyed. New technology was a passion for him. So why not turn this passion into a new career? In the early 1970s, he founded his own company, the Chicago Music Corporation. His trade? The installation of stereo car radios. At the time, hi-fi systems were still fairly new on the market, but were quickly becoming very popular. Werner Hartmann was one of the industry pioneers, hence his nickname. Of course, it's often a stereotype now, but can you imagine a time when you couldn't have had music playing in your car? By the end of the 70s, you'd have been walking down the street hearing various disco hits, from the Bee Gees to ABBA to the Commodores, emanating from car windows. In the early days, Werner couldn't even afford a workshop. So he often installed the stereo systems on site for his customers, at their houses or places of work. But his determination paid off. By 1977, the once penniless immigrant had become a millionaire. His private life, however, wasn't going quite as well. The long hours he was putting in and his single-minded work ethic had meant that his marriage to Vasily had suffered. 
and she filed for divorce the same year. After a time, Werner, newly single, sought solace in the nightclubs and strip bars on Chicago's west side. In one of those bars, called the Smoker's Lounge, he met a 24-year-old dancer named Deborah Stover. She invited him to a private VIP room, and the two were inseparable all night. They started dating. It all progressed very quickly. and Before long, Deborah had moved into Werner's home. The couple were married within six months. However, right from the start, it was said that Deborah left no one, including her husband, in the dark. This was by no means a marriage based in love on her part. The pull for her was solely Werner's wealth and status. Now, for his part, Werner believed that if he kept showering her with gifts, his wife would eventually love him back. He bought her fur coats, jewellery, diamonds and a Rolls Royce, but it didn't change how she treated him and she let him know it. She was increasingly staying away from the home overnight, hanging out at parties, abusing substances and having multiple affairs. After turning a blind eye for nearly two years, Werner couldn't stand it anymore. One morning, when Deborah returned home from yet another long night of partying, dressed only in a fur coat and heels, a violent argument broke out. Werner threatened her with a gun and Deborah fled, escaping in her Rolls Royce. He followed her, running down the drive and firing several shots in her direction as the car drove away. Another night, the police pulled over her car, asking why she'd thrown several champagne flutes out of the window as she'd been driving through downtown Chicago. A quick check in the car revealed that she'd been travelling with a well-known drug dealer and had a handgun concealed under her seat. By October 1981, Deborah had begun dating John Korobik. She made no effort to hide the affair or spare Werner's feelings. Finally, he'd had enough and decided to file for divorce. At Christmas, Werner got back in contact with his ex-wife, Vasily. Yes, his private life was a mess, but now his business was in financial difficulty too. Vasily, an accountant, agreed to come back and take a detailed look at the books for him. When she checked the records, she was shocked. Hartman and his company were practically bankrupt. Many of his expensive purchases weren't even his. They were financed on credit, loans that he could hardly repay now. Unpaid bills were piled up high on his desk. Publicly, Hartman was still considered to be the stereo king, a successful self-made millionaire. But one look at the books told a different story. In January 1982, Deborah left their Northbrook home and moved in with her boyfriend John, who still lived with his parents. The two went out partying almost every night, but it wasn't sustainable long term. Deborah had no income of her own, and John only worked part time as a salesman in the gun store. Of course, she'd become so accustomed to her life of luxury with Werner, she now resented this new normal greatly. Meanwhile, Hartman tried to rearrange his personal affairs. He'd had two life insurance policies in the past, one for $150,000 from Prudential Insurance and another for $100,000 from another company. In both cases, Deborah had so far been the sole beneficiary, should anything happen to him. According to several friends, in the spring of 1982, Werner now wanted to appoint his two daughters, Eva and Stephanie, as beneficiaries, and to delete the name of his estranged wife from the contract. He called the responsible clerk at the insurance company and asked him to make the appropriate changes. Strangely, shortly before his death, he took out another life insurance policy with Prudential, this one paying out $250,000. For someone struggling to survive financially, that seemed a bit odd. In addition, he also had a clause inserted into both Prudential contracts that guaranteed double the payout if the cause of death was either an accident or a violent crime. The total coverage from all policies amounted to a whopping $800,000, which is about two and a half million in today's money. There was one hitch. When Prudential sent him the new insurance certificate, his now estranged wife, Deborah, was still listed as the sole beneficiary. He reported the oversight 
and was reassured by the clerk that he would take care of the matter immediately. Though actually, nothing was changed before Hartman was murdered in early June. Several friends testified independently of one another that Werner had feared for his life since the first week of June 1982. At the time, he had overheard part of a phone call his wife had had with John Korobik. Deborah had actually spent more time with her husband and stepdaughters in the weeks leading up to the murder. On one occasion, she telephoned her lover from the Hartman house. Werner gathered from snippets of the conversation that the two were planning to have someone killed. His friends advised him to contact the police, but he said he wanted to take care of the matter himself. It is known that before his death he was looking for a bodyguard. How different things might have been that he acted with a little more urgency. The murder made headlines. In their north suburb of Chicago, violent crime was exceedingly rare. The crime scene, a mansion, the victim, a well-known millionaire, the wife a suspect, along with her tennis pro boyfriend. People found the elements of the case fascinating. Even the rich were not immune to betrayal and treachery. But although a concrete motive for the crime was suspected with the life insurance policies, the investigation stalled. Police were unable to prove either Deborah or John had committed or given the instruction to murder Werner. Hartman's ex-wife and daughters were frustrated. They had no doubt about who was behind the murder. But nobody was arrested. On the contrary, John Korobik now moved into the Hartman mansion with Deborah. And shortly afterward, Deborah asked for the payout from the two Prudential life insurance policies. Fortunately, the insurance company refused to transfer the sum. There's probably a clause about them not having to, as long as the wife is still considered a suspect in an ongoing murder investigation. Deborah Hartman retaliated by filing a lawsuit against Prudential. Then, a mere three months after the murder, Northbrook police received another 911 call from the Hartman house. On site, John Korobik opened the door to police sporting two bloody trouser legs. He explained that he was handling a pistol and shot himself accidentally. Apparently, he managed to hit both his thighs at the same time. Deborah Hartman was also present, but said that she'd been in a different area of the house and hadn't heard the shots. The police didn't find the story credible. For one thing, Korobik had worked in a gun shop. It could therefore be assumed that he was familiar with the proper use of handguns. But since John maintained his account, police had no reason to report him. Shortly after the incident, Deborah and her lover separated and Korobik moved back out of the house. In January 1984, a year and a half after the murder, Deborah reached an out-of-court settlement with the Prudential Insurance. Unbelievably, she received $589,000 from her late husband's policies instead of the 800,000 she'd anticipated originally. But in the interim, she'd also accumulated considerable debt, which now had to be paid off. She'd sold the mansion and moved into a smaller one-story house. With the renewed windfall from the insurance payouts, she bought a new Mercedes and the plate Deborah II to go on it. She then hired builders to remodel her new house. She wanted a second floor of living space high ceilings, a skylight, and a grand spiral staircase. However, when the carpenter was three quarters finished with the work, he walked off the project because Deborah refused to pay the outstanding bills. In 1985, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, ATF, investigated a gun trafficking ring in Chicago. ATF agent Jim Delorto had posed as an interested buyer in an undercover operation. So-called arms dealer Kenneth Canel offered him several stolen guns and a stolen car and got himself arrested in the process. ATF, however, was only interested in the illegal arms trade. Stolen cars weren't a federal crime, so Delorto turned to his colleagues in the Illinois State Police and asked whether they wanted to pursue that aspect of the case. Trooper David Hamm was responsible for that department. During one interview with Delorto, the suspect, Colonel, mentioned an accident that he'd almost had with a submachine gun. A Mac-10 had continued to fire long after he'd released the trigger. 
Fortunately, the errant shots had only gone up into the ceiling. At the mention of the Mac-10, David Ham pricked up his ears. That mate was rather unusual and rarely appeared in connection with crime. But the officer remembered very well that a Mac-10 was the weapon sought in the murder of Werner Hartmann. Three years earlier, every newspaper in the state had reported extensively on the case. Ham checked the name of the arrested man in the usual databases and made an interesting discovery. Who do you imagine Kenneth Canel was living with today? None other than John Korobik, one of the two main suspects in the unsolved Hartman case. Delotto and Ham lent on Canel, making it clear that he would go to prison for many years for trafficking in weapons. There was only one chance to get a lighter sentence. He must offer up information, good enough information, to make prosecution seriously consider a deal. They got more specific. What did he know about his roommate, Korobik, and about Deborah Hartman with regard to Werner's murder? Kanel offered his cooperation, even agreeing to meet up with Deborah whilst wearing a wire. He would extract a confession from her and they would have everything on tape. But Delorto and Ham were cynical. Kanel appeared to be eager to help, but could they rely on him? The officers were supposed to remain in their vehicle whilst Kanel entered the house to speak with Deborah. Instead, they crept closer to the building and peered through the window. As they watched, Kanel lifted his shirt silently and showed Deborah the wire he was wearing, giving the entire game away. What seemed like a promising breakthrough had just become another dead end. But Delorto and Ham weren't ready to give up. They collected the box of case files from the Northbrook Police Department and started to look through them again from the beginning. The files contained reports, transcripts, photos and evidence, and their colleagues had, in fact, overlooked some details. For instance, nobody had noticed that Hartman's signature on the last insurance policy taken out was nothing like his normal one. Deeply suspicious. And that led to another question. Who had actually raised the insurance premium for the third policy? It was only $450. But Werner was in dire financial straits at the time. Why would he have taken out another policy when he was struggling to cover the premiums on the first two? Delorto and Ham questioned the insurance company. They wanted to see the deposit check to verify the date and, more importantly, the signature. It turned out the check had disappeared. Fortunately, a listing of John Korobik's financial records was found in the investigation file, and there it was, in black and white. Korobik had used his credit card to pay Werner Hartmann's insurance premium. They asked themselves why Deborah's lover would be making her husband's payments, and came to the conclusion that Werner's murder was part of an insurance fraud that had been planned for a long time. Next, Delorto and Ham checked the phone records for each of the suspects. Close analysis revealed a pattern. Deborah Hartman first called Harvey Luchton, the Prudential Insurance Clerk. Then she called Korobik, and finally his friend, Colonel. Colonel then called Korobik, who in turn called Luchton. This kind of telephone chain had occurred several times before and after Werner's murder. The investigators targeted Harvey Luchton first, thinking that he was perhaps the weakest link in the chain. He was, after all, a normal citizen with a regular job who'd never been in trouble with the law. Their instincts were correct, and he broke down and confessed the truth fairly quickly when threatened with imprisonment. According to him, Deborah had somehow discovered that Werner wanted to remove her as a beneficiary from his life insurance policies. She tracked him down at work and offered him $3,000 in cash if he would help her, and possibly a few sexual favours on top, according to the police report. First, Deborah had asked Luchton to make her husband's form on which he listed several other beneficiaries disappear. She had already brought an alternative application on which she had apparently forged her husband's signature. Luchton was instructed to reinstate her as the beneficiary. And since he'd not yet processed the form, none of his colleagues noticed the fraud. Delorto and Ham then interrogated Kenneth Canel again 
and confronted him with the new information. He admitted that Deborah Hartman and John Korobik had hatched the murder plan. They turned to him because they knew he made his money from criminal activities. They offered him $50,000 to kill Werner Hartman for them. However, he said he refused. Supposedly because the weapon that Korobik had given him for the assassination jammed during a test. Delorto and Ham conferred with the prosecutor. There was still no evidence that the four people involved in the plot actually carried out the murder. And it was still unclear who had actually pulled the trigger. Kennel's testimony may have been just a protective claim. Any shrewd lawyer would cross-examine a professional criminal's testimony and break it down into its component parts in a matter of minutes. Perhaps the prospect of $50,000 was too tempting for him and he had accepted the offer. But how could he be convicted without concrete evidence? However, prosecutors Stephen Miller and John Farrell came up with a plan to get the results they were after. The strategy had already worked for Al Capone. Famously, the Mafia boss was never tried for any of the murders he commissioned. There was simply no evidence for that. But the authorities finally brought Capone down by being able to prove his tax evasion. The amounts involved were comparatively small, but crucially, enough to put him behind bars for a long time. So in January 1989, prosecutors presented the case before a federal jury in Chicago. There, the suspects, Deborah Hartman, John Korobik and Ken Kanel, were accused of several counts of mail and wire fraud. If convicted, those accused of these crimes could face up to 20 years in prison under federal law. The advantage of this prosecution strategy was that the public prosecutor's office did not have to prove which of the accused had murdered Werner Hartmann. All that was needed to convince the jury was to show that the three defendants had conspired to collect the victim's various life insurance policies. This, logically, required the death of the policyholder. It didn't matter who pulled the trigger. With Henry Luchton, the prosecution was able to present a witness who could support this conspiracy. The court hearing lasted three weeks, but in the end, there was no real clarification on the case. Prosecutors called Curtis Stover, Deborah Hartman's brother, to the witness stand. He claimed that John Korobik confessed to the murder shortly after the crime. However, it was only years afterwards that he turned to the police with this supposed insider knowledge. The brother was also in custody at the time of his testimony for burglary, so the circumstances weren't great for his credibility. Donald Zork, another witness, testified that Kenneth Kennel offered him and his brother $6,000 for an alibi on the night of the crime. Kennel appeared to them that evening, about three hours after the crime, in some distress. But there were also issues with the validity of his witness statement. Zork had given his account to the police in 1986, four years after the crime. And in addition, he too had had prior convictions for burglaries and theft. Ultimately, it wasn't clear who had held the submachine gun and pulled the trigger. Investigators suspected that Deborah Hartman let either John Korobik or Kenneth Kalin into the home. The perpetrator probably hid in the bedroom and waited until Werner came out of the shower to shoot the defenceless man. The jury took only three hours to deliberate. They found all four defendants guilty. The judge sentenced Deborah Hartman to 22 years in prison, Kenneth Kainel to 20 years, and John Korobik to 16 years. Henry Luchton got away with just two years in prison for his information and agreement to testify against the others. However, as is often the case, the perpetrators did not have to serve their sentences in full. John Korobik was released at the end of March 1999 having served 10 years, and Deborah Hartman at the end of September 2002 after serving 13. Kenneth Kainel died in 1996. Following the criminal proceedings, Werner Hartman's daughters filed a civil lawsuit against Prudential Insurance and Deborah Hartman. They claimed the full amount that the insurer had paid Deborah and the court found in their favour. Prudential was instructed to pay but was allowed to recover what was left of the $589,000 paid to Deborah in 1984. 
Tragically, no one has ever been charged with the murder of Werner Hartmann, and the case remains technically unsolved. Deborah's current whereabouts are unknown.